In this video, we're going to consider the effects of temperature on solubility equilibrium systems and look at how we can use temperature in order to decrease the amount of toxic heavy metal ions that end up in water supplies. Now, even though solubility equilibria don't normally consider delta H, understanding where delta H is important in order to look at how to shift the equilibrium system. So if we consider the effect of entropy on this reaction, we would expect that entropy would favor the dissociation reaction because we have a greater number of product particles than we do reactants, and our products also exist in a more disordered state of matter. So if this equilibrium forms because entropy and enthalpy favor opposite sides, that must mean that enthalpy must favor the precipitation reaction, meaning that we would expect delta H to be in the reactants. With this knowledge, we can then make a prediction about how to shift the equilibrium towards our reactants so that we decrease the concentration of lead ions dissolved in a sample of water. Now, in order to do this, we can draw a potential energy curve and remember the importance of activation energy on predicting the effects of temperature shifts based on Le Chatelier's principle. In the forward direction, our reaction is endothermic, meaning that the activation energy of the forward reaction is significantly less than the activation energy of the reverse reaction. Therefore, if we were to decrease temperature, even though a temperature decrease is going to decrease both reaction rates, we would, effect, we would expect that it would decrease the forward rate, being the, ex, or the endothermic reaction, to a greater degree than it would affect the reverse rate, because endothermic reactions are disproportionately affected by temperature decreases because you're decreasing the amount of kinetic energy that is available, making it even harder to achieve the higher activation energy. Therefore, if we decrease the temperature, we are effectively making the endothermic reaction almost impossible to happen, meaning that our reverse reaction, the exothermic reaction, which also happens to be the precipitation reaction, is favored. This is one way that we can decrease the amount of lead ions within solution by decreasing the temperature and shifting the equilibrium to favor the precipitation reaction. So if this is so intuitive, why don't we do it on an industrial scale? Well, can you think of a way that we can easily decrease uh, the temperature of, a, of an entire river's water supply on an industrial scale? Short of pumping an entire river's water through a freezer, this is basically impossible to do. So controlled decreases in temperature, for example, using a freezer, almost always require a large energy input because obviously try operating your freezer without having it plugged in. So the obvious disadvantage of a very large energy input in order to lower the temperature of an entire contaminated river, the primary barrier to this is the cost of electricity. And considering how much simpler it is to just increase the concentration of one of the ions in the solution, this is obviously not an ideal situation that we can use. But what about a final variable? What about if we were to actually change the solution volume? So the way that this would work, uh, if we decrease the amount of solvent, so uh, as the volume of solvent decreases, which in this case would be uh, the volume of contaminated water, this means that the concentration of not just the toxic heavy metal ion, but also the ion that is used to precipitate it, is going to increase. Now, if the concentration of both of these ions increases, that means that we would be increasing the reverse rate of the reaction and therefore causing more precipitate to form if the reverse rate is greater than the forward rate. So if these concentrations increase, that would mean the rate of precipitation is going to increase as well, and therefore the solubility of our precipitate is going to decrease 
because the precipitation reaction is favored over the dissociation reaction. Now, the obvious problem of how to do this is how do we actually decrease the solution volume without decreasing the number of moles of each of the ions that we have? Well, the easiest way that I can think of is evaporation, to actually heat the water supply so that water evaporates, but the ions stay within the solution. Now, the problem about doing this is that evaporation obviously requires an increase in temperature. Now, if we assume that delta H is in the place where we assumed in the previous situation, we know that increasing temperature pushes the equilibrium away from delta H because even though an increase in temperature would increase both reaction rates, the extra heat produced by the exothermic reaction can then feed into the reaction and push the reaction the opposite way. So therefore, when temperature is increased, equilibrium is going to shift to the products, meaning that solubility is actually going to increase because shifting the equilibrium to the products means that we're going to get more dissolved ions. So the problem is that increasing, uh, increasing temperature or increasing the temperature of the reaction conditions in order to decrease the solvent volume, these seem to have two contradictory effects because even though if we get rid of a certain volume of solvent, that would mean that the concentration increases would push the equilibrium towards the precipitate, the increase in temperature required to do that would have the opposite effects. And because these two have opposing effects, this is not a practical solution for water treatment either. One simple solution to get around this is, well, if we don't have any solvent at all, then these ions cannot stay within solution if there's no water to dissolve them. So a simple solution to get around this is simply to evaporate the entire solution so that only the precipitate remains. And this is actually done on relatively smaller scales. So if we were to take a sample of contaminated water and increase the temperature, we could allow the water to evaporate and trap the solute, in this case the lead-containing precipitate, at the bottom of the solution. And if there's no water to dissolve it, then the solute, our precipitate, is all that remains. The problem is, think about how much energy input is required to do this for an entire contaminated river. So asking the question, is it cost effective to evaporate an entire river's water supply? Well, the answer for most people, unless you have several hundred billion dollars lying around, is going to be no. So even though we've learned that there are ways of shifting solubility equilibria to favor the precipitation reaction by modifying temperature and by modifying volume, from an engineering perspective, these are not cost effective when it comes to precipitation. And precipitation by using common ions is still the most cost effective way of water treatment and therefore this is the most common way that water treatment works. In the final video in this section, we're going to take a look at how to predict exactly when a precipitate forms based on the known concentrations of ions that exist within a contaminated water source.